So, good morning, brothers and sisters. As we return to this segment of the book of Judges, chapter 16. Shall we ask our Heavenly Father for his guidance, for his wisdom, and for his blessing, so that we may more properly apply the symbols that we are finding <coughs> and use these to address the lines that we have been discussing and their import for our time. Shall we pray? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the light that you are providing. We thank you for the ability that we have to gather the light, all of the light, to be able to understand that which you would have us to understand at this time in Earth's history. Direct us today, help us so that what we do as we study, as we come together, may be of edification. Place us where you would have us to be. Direct us so that we may more properly understand the light that is being given. Help us to have the strength and the willingness to gather this light, to be directed as you would have us be directed so that we may be then clothed in your character, in your righteousness. For without you, there is no righteousness. We must, like Abraham, like Moses, like Elijah, like John the Baptist, become righteous by our faith in you. Direct us now. Please join with us in this meeting for we claim the promise that where two or more are gathered, there you will be also. As we come into your presence, help us so that we may discuss things reverently, keeping in mind that you are ever before us. May your spirit attend us and guide us. May your angels protect us. For this we ask and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Now, we left off briefly yesterday in this segment. And Samson said unto the lad that held him by the hand, suffer me that I may feel the pillars upon whereupon the house standeth, that I may lean upon them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were upon the roof about 3,000 men and women that beheld while Samson made sport, was made sport. So the house was filled with church and state. And the leaders of church and state were there. And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines from my two eyes. Now, the question that I had asked yesterday, why is Samson using such a variety of manners of referring to God in this particular portion? What should we be seeing here? 
So I'm gonna I'm gonna pull this up using eSword, looking at Judges 16, 28. Yeah. So he's you say an Adonai Yahweh, um, and then Elohim. So he uses three different titles. Right. So he he goes into this. According to what I'm seeing using Esword, he first calls upon Jehovah. Yes, yeah, so he called unto the Lord. He doesn't say that, but uh, the writer says that he called unto the Lord. And then using the words that he said, Adonai, Jehovah. So Lord and God, both complete capitals, those are Yahweh or Jehovah. So why, why would the translators have this instead of Jehovah as Jehovah? Oh, because you want to go into uh, how to properly pronounce God's name? No, I, I want to go into why the difference in the way the translator had. Well, because, uh, okay, so you're saying in the translators... Um, So the reason the reason I'm not touching on how to properly pronounce God's name, okay. there has been quite a small segment that has been yeah. working in this area, trying to disrupt meetings because their claim has been that God's name has not been being pronounced properly. And that's not something that, that I see we really need to be touching. Plus, we don't really know how to pronounce it properly. Right. It's, it's, not, it's not, I mean, especially when you're looking in the past, how much language changes and pronunciation changes. Right. And if somebody says, you know, they call me Theodore because they can't pronounce a TH. I mean, I still know who, who they're talking about. Um, so... No, because Colin calls me Theodore. Really? Well, he doesn't pronounce the TH. Interesting. I mean, he almost pronounces it, but doesn't quite. But anyway, um, so when they're looking at here at the different vowel pointings that are done in, um, because you have uh, 3068 and 3069. Right. Right. So it's just vowel pointings um, that are done. So uh, why they choose, why the Masoretics uh, chose the different vowel pointings, I have no idea. Um, Is there a difference in the translation between Yehovah and Yehovi? No, there's no, no no difference in meaning. That's what you're asking. Okay. I mean, um, the reason why they might vowel point it differently, one might be really more my God is a possibility, but okay. in the old form of it. Okay. You know, my, my Jehovah, in a sense, but they don't put the, the Yod at the end. They just uh, put a different vowel pointing to show that. Okay, so why would he call on both um, Adonai and Elohim? I don't know. I guess the, the reason I was looking at this the way I was mm -hmm. with these, these different linguistic segments being presented, I'm having to ask if this is a type of repetition, but if it's a repetition, since it's using four different alliterations to our Heavenly Father, 
and to Christ if this is not a representation of the messages of Revelation 14 and 18. Yeah, I don't know. Um, all I know is when they say Adonai, that means my Lord. It has a yod at the end. And then he says Adonai Yehovi, which is just normally how you would say it. Um, if you're going to be putting Adonai in front of Yehovah. Okay. So I don't know why they do that, but I think it would have something to do with the fact that he's referring to my, my Lord Jehovah, rather than just referring to, so that it's, um, it's in the, um, Know, the first person so that's the only thing I can think but yeah then he calls him uh, Elohim right which is just another title for God okay so as we continue, and Samson took hold of the two middle pillars upon which the house stood, and on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and of the other with his left. So, north and south. Now, uh, regarding 1629, yes. so we had talked about this, um, and it's four years and 168 days. Now, I looked at different places that I could place this between significant dates in our line, and the only place I could really do that is if I go to June 9th, 2018, um, which is where Jeff closes the Sabbath with the 9-11 prayer and the next day. Um, and we count the 126 days from there, whether we do it ordinarily or cardinally. Um, it goes to October 13th. So that's when we have time setting introduced into the movement. And if we're going to take a parallel between um, Ezekiel 1629 days, so Ezekiel begins to prophesy on the fifth day of the fourth month and he's going to have his prophecy regarding the siege of Jerusalem fulfilled 1629 days later uh, if we're going to go from June 9th and take that as a parallel that would end on Thanksgiving this year so November 24th is 1629 days from June 9th uh, 2018 now are we talking Canadian Thanksgiving or American yeah, Thanksgiving? No, Amer American Thanksgiving. Canadian Thanksgiving isn't prophetically significant. So, yeah, so it's American Thanksgiving coming up on November. Uh, today is Canadian Thanksgiving. Okay, but I'm just I'm just making sure that we're clear on that point. Yeah, I, I don't really consider Canadian Thanksgiving as anything. So, um, so no November twenty fourth. Now, we, it's four years and 168 days, and we know 168 days is a symbol of a week because it's 168, 168 days in, in uh, 168 hours in a week in seven days. So four years and 168 days, which is really 1,461 days plus 168 days is 1629. So, so that's what we were dealing with last time, addressing that 1629. Okay. So could we have anything dealing with uh, 1629 days um, having to do with um, some message presently? I mean... <clears throat> I 
that's a subject that I hadn't previously considered. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's interesting to bring that up in the way that you're bringing it up right now. So, okay. from, from the chat, that it's 1,111 days from July 18th to December 20, or 1124. Yeah. Okay, so... So 1111 is obviously a symbol. So explain the 1111 symbol. Uh, Well, we have 11 generations to the flood and 11 generations uh, to Jacob, which is 20 generations. We have the 11 years that divides the 22 years in the story of Joseph from his dreams to the fulfillment of his dream the center of which is the butler and the baker's two dreams. Um, We have Daniel 11, 11. Um, Things like that. There's, there's. So what, what, what he's doing here is he's taking another symbol from July 18 and showing that, that 1124 of this year is, is also tied. So it's not just a single, symbol we now have two symbols that tie that date whatever it means uh, we do know that we have this prediction regarding the midterm elections on november 8th and um so that's going to be uh what 14 days later two weeks later or two no 16 days later thank you yeah 16 days later Depending on how we count it, it'd be either 15 or 16 days later. So, well, the elections on the the Tuesday, right? Correct. And then you have the Thursday is Thanksgiving, so that's normally 16 days. 16 days inclusive. That'd be a cardinal count. No, it'd be 17 inclusive. Okay. That's the the cardinal and the ordinal are are two things that I still struggle with. So that's why I'm I'm asking for clarification. Okay. Okay. So I don't know if it means anything, but but we have now two symbols, the 1629 and 1111. And 11 and 11, Daniel 1111 deals with the king of the north and the king of the south. So the right hand and the left hand refer to north and south. But also we have uh, Daniel chapter 12 dealing with the right hand and left hand. Right. Right. So in Daniel chapter 12, um, the man clothed in linen lifts up his um, right hand and his left hand unto heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever that it shall be for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. So there we have um, the left and the right hand also mentioned here. Now, in this context, it's really dealing with uh, the first half of the 2520, because this is the scattering of the power of the holy people that's accomplished under the, the first desolating power of paganism. And... Uh, it's going to be the last half that that is contained within the 1290, right? Okay. So, um, so anyway, you have this left and right hand. So regarding two pillars, I mean, can two pillars refer to uh, two different prophecies or, or parts of prophecies? Well, <clears throat> we were applying those pillars initially in the moral story yeah. as being the equivalent of Sunday sacredness and the immortality of the soul. Right, which we would still take. Then we were talking about this as how this would be within the corporate church currently. Mm-hmm. 
where now were we addressing this where one is of the false worship on Sabbath? And I'm not remembering how we were approaching the second one. Okay, so so when we take these pillars and we're applying them to the moral story, this is dealing with the Sunday law. Dagon represents the papacy, right? The the that's the the whole issue there is what we see happening around us in this negative sense. Right. 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 So this is these are this is the papacy. Then when we take this and we apply it, ironically, we apply it to Christ um, in just the the story turned around and Samson represents Christ. Right. And all of these things are now positive. Okay. Right. So these pillars have to be uh, truths. Right. And. Um, you know, Christ in his death upon the cross does affirm the Sabbath and also the resurrection of resurrection of the dead. Yeah, the resurrection of the dead, right? Um oh it's nine eleven, two thousand nineteen. That's eleven hundred and eleven. Okay. Um and then you have uh if we take this story and we apply this whole story of Samson and Delilah, we apply it to uh, Ellen White's line, what we call the big line, that is the first, second, and third angel's message and the fourth angel's message. Okay. And, and these pillars still then are uh, the Sabbath and the immortality of this uh, and, and, and the true view of understanding of the state of the dead, right? Correct. All right. Now, when we apply this to our movement, the reason why we do that is we take these symbols like 1629. I mean, as far as I know, we're not going to apply 1629 to any of these other histories, but we can apply it to our history because we've already had this symbol there. And so we take 1629 now, and that would be applying this these symbols specifically to this movement. So okay. then we would have to look at what the pillars are, what Samson represents the July 18th uh, prophecy, right? And, and the question is, he takes hold of the two middle, middle pillars upon which the house stood and the one which was born up, the one on the right hand and the other on the left. So then we'd have to say, well, what are these pillars? What is the right hand pillar? What is the left hand pillar? Right. That, that's the way that I would do it, whether that's correct. So if you're going to maybe connect it to July 18, we had that Nashville, obviously, that was the fireball was going to hit the colors. Yeah. So. OK, so the pillars there dealing with the pillars in Nashville. Yes. And, and definitely we have the symbol of the pillars attached to the July 18, 2020 uh, prediction. So, yeah, you, you definitely can take that symbol there and attach it. But now when we talk about the middle pillars, I mean, the middle represents midway. and and the house then would represent what? Parthenon. Well, yes, it, okay. But see, we're taking this story here. This is, so you're going to take that this, these middle pillars and the house is the Parthenon. But we would have to look at this a bit more symbolically than that. We can take these symbols, like the pillars, um, and, and here house uh, is just the regular word bet, or bayet, right, which isn't like a temple or anything generally, even though it can refer to a temple. Uh, but it's not a word specifically for a temple. Um, 
And so these pillars, we would normally take them as uh, prophecies, I would think, not just literally the pillars, even though we have them as a symbol, the pillars become a symbol of our prediction, right? Um, just as the right hand and the left hand are symbols. You know, I don't think we would say on November uh, 20, 24th, 2022, that uh, Nashville is going to be hit uh, with this uh, fireball or nuclear attack. Is it possible that the house in our line is representing the corporate church? Um, no, because it would have to represent this movement. And, and this, this taking hold of the two middle, middle pillars, we can't see as destructive. We have to take this in the positive sense. So this would have to do the opposite of destruction. This is um, taking hold of some truths. But and, <clears throat> and the house would have to be this movement if we're going to take it in, in how we've been doing it. Why couldn't it do that in the negative sense? I mean, well, we, we're making the application with the Catholic Church. I see that. But mm -hmm. we all, we're also aware that it's going to come to a point where the, the church itself begins to more present the need to worship on Sunday at least to get along with the government okay so this is the message of july 18th if we're taking it as the message of july 18th samson and that message that produces not just july 18th but produces the 144,000. okay if he takes hold of the two middle middle pillars these would have to be truths they couldn't be the pillars of of the catholic church we do that in the Sunday law, which is um, taking this application in the moral story. So the moral story we can apply to our time. So the pillars there are going to be um, the immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness, right? So if you're going to deal with that story, yes, then... Um, we, we would apply this to the Catholic Church. Now you're saying you, in that moral story, you want to apply it to the Adventist Church. I'm asking if we can. Well, I don't know if the Adventist Church stands upon the immortality of the soul and Sunday, Sunday sacredness. I mean, so I don't, I don't know if we could do that. But I know we're looking at different stories. I'm just saying when we're looking at the symbolic nature of the 1629 that it relates to this movement okay and to the symbolic sunday law because that's odilio uh, brought out this this symbol and we can see that it does relate right dealing with the mandates so now we know the, that that's all part of a typical sunday law but it has to do with our our movement our message so now we take the pillars, we take the house, we take the right hand, the left hand, and we must take this as, and what Samson's going to do in his death here, I think we would have to take more as symbolic of Paul saying, I die daily, that type of idea, that this is about the conversion of this movement. All right. Yeah, we have the left and the right foot mentioned as well when we looked at in Revelation chapter 10 on the sea and the land. Um, just a note from the chat. So anyway, that's how I'm understanding this, this um, 
these symbols. Once we look at these symbols that relate to our movement, then we have to relate the interpretation of that to our movement. But it doesn't change the other lines. Like um, when we look at the moral story, we can still see this is about the Sunday law. Um, so, so yeah, so it does happen on different levels. I just don't see how we would apply this to the Adventist church. Okay. <clears throat> now, here again, the way my simple mind works, I look at Judges 16, 29, additively, we have the number 45. Mm -hmm. And if we were to take that in the reverse with 16 removed from 29, we also have 13. Yeah, so a symbol of rebellion. Right. Yeah. And, and the 45 is, of course, can also be understood the fifth day of the fourth month. You know, right. Month, fifth day, which is where Ezekiel is going to begin the 1629 days. Right. Goes to the siege. Okay. Is there anything else that we can see from this particular passage? So in 1630, and Samson said, let me die with the Philistines or let my soul die with the Philistines. And he bowed with all his bowed himself with all his might and the house fell upon the lords and upon all the people that were therein so the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life you have 3,000 men and women on the roof you have 3,000 possibly more in the house itself you have the lad and you have Samson, the lad that had held his hand. Yes, Samson was committing suicide, but he's committing suicide to be avenged for being blind, for being blinded. Any other thoughts on this verse? Is there anything else that we can see here? Okay. Yeah, well, the only thing that we have is um, uh, we know that there's 3,000, which we touched on before. That's in verse 27. Right. So this is going to be the number of people that are on the roof. And, and, and I believe that's the number then that, I mean, that's the number that we're given. We're not given any other number regarding how many people he kills in this situation. But if you right. have 3,000 on the roof itself, <clears throat> would it not be logical that there are others in the house? Yeah, but it doesn't mean everybody on the roof necessarily dies. All I'm saying is that's the only number we're given, right? So Stephen had calculated this number before as um, 4,030 that are old that are connected with these deaths. There's the 1,000, there's the 30, and there's the 3,000. Um, okay.
Yeah, I was working on a guitar yesterday, and the model number was 4030, which is kind of interesting. Um, <laughs> um, so we, we have this 3000, and we, we know that it relates to, of course, the number three and also the 300. But is there, is there anything else that we could have done with this number? Well, we have it. We have this related to three. I think we could also have it related to thirty, and then to three thousand. How much deeper could we go with this? I don't know. I mean, usually we take these numbers and we relate them to time. And I guess the way that Stephen has done it is you have the 4,030, and that relates to the 403, which is the number of months that, that occur in 391 Julian months is 403 lunar months, right? So that relates to the Islamic calendar, the relationship between those two. Um, Uh, the interesting thing, I know this is kind of obscure, <laughs> um, but if we take this 4030, so it says that these are more uh, than he slayed, he slayed, um, killed more with his death than in his life, um, right? So I, I did some calculations here. Um, so the one calculation was, um, if you subtract the two, you get 1970. I don't know if that means anything. But then I thought about uh, taking this number, 3,000, and it's subtracting 1629. And I get the number 2,401. Do you know the significance of that number? Well, that's one jubilee week away from the 2450. Right. So it's actually uh, the square of 49. Okay. Right. So 49 times 49 is 2,401. Um, Iran says 1970 is an epoch for computer time, mostly file systems plus... Uh, other usages. Okay. We have the number uh, the 24th day of the first month, maybe, being symbolized now the take us to Daniel 10. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so Daniel chapter 10, the 24th day of the first month. Um, I'm not picking up on what you're yeah, so that's that's the date when Gabriel comes oh. to Daniel and Okay. Okay. Okay, which is important to this movement as well. I mean I mean these in a sense are kind of obscure references, but if they're saying something to this movement, they're not really that obscure.
It's just that we're finding an interrelation with so many of these things mm -hmm. in different prophetic messages. So it, it's tying this portion of Judges more completely with the book of Daniel than I think we, we had ever thought would be possible. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so the prophecy of Daniel... So, so we have here um, Daniel 11, 11. That's connecting November 9th, 2019 to this November 24th, 2022 date, which we got from the 1629. We have the left and the right hand. So that dies, ties us to Daniel chapter 12. And now we have this symbol by subtracting the 1629 from the 3000 we have a symbol that brings us to daniel chapter 10. so the 1629 is like a key that unlocks some things anybody know what 1629 is in iso It's rather obscure. That's very obscure. Yeah. No, I don't have a, I don't have a clue on that. So it's it's a symbol that's used. Um, the ISO symbols uh, 1629 is rubber and lattices. All right. But the, the only thing here that's interesting is lattices. Because what is a lattice? In gardening, it'd be something that you put up to allow something else to climb. Yeah, but the, the nature of a lattice is that it's lines that are crossed with each other. Right. So you have parallel lines uh, running um, uh, horizontally with each other. So you have a, a bunch of parallel lines. So that, that's what a lattice is. But, but that's the symbol of 1629. If you use it as a symbol, that's the only thing that comes up on Wikipedia as a symbol. Um, so I thought it was interesting dealing with the lattices because we have that in um, the story of Esther. Um, okay. well, there they use the word, uh, a different word, which is, um, um, but it's still the same type of idea. Um, uh, what's the word they use in Esther? I'm trying to remember. Uh, anybody know what I'm talking about? Tetelation, what is it? Um, Stephen, do you remember what that is? Yeah, the tessellation. Tessellation, yeah. So that, that's a type of lattice pattern, right? Yeah, you, you also have uh, is it, uh, Amaziah or Azahiah. I guess the fell through a lattice. Remember the time of uh, Elijah? Yes, so um, there you're dealing with uh, Ahaziah fell through a lattice in his upper chamber, right? And then you also have the mother of Sisera looked out at a window and cried through the lattice. And we also have it in the Song of Solomon. Uh, My beloved is like a roe or a young heart. Behold, he standeth behind our wall. He looketh forth at the windows showing himself through the lattice. So we have it mentioned three times in scripture, though they're not all the same word. Each one is a different word, but translated in the King James as lattice. Okay.
so anyway, that it's just an interesting the 1629. Um, so it shows a lattice is kind of a complex structure of lines. Interwoven lines, which would relate to the the earlier one of the weaving, because that technically is a type of lattice. All right. So that's in relation to 1629. Is there anything further in relation to 1630? In the in the moral story, Samson is asking to die with the Philistines. In the ironic story, he is willingly die, willing to die not just for his people, but for those that are putting him to death. Yeah, and well, in Christ, I mean, Christ dies for all men. Right. Yeah. We know that Christ bowed himself upon the cross and stated, it is finished. Here is Samson bowing himself with all of his might. With these pillars, as he's bowing himself, is it that he's pushing the pillars apart or is he pulling the pillars together? Or do we have an idea? Well, I would think he's pushing them apart. Right. But it's probably just because I read Uncle Arthur's Bible story books and that's how they show it. Okay. But, but that's what I picture in between the two pillars pushing them to the side. I mean, if he was chained to the pillars, you know, maybe he could pull them in, but it doesn't say he was chained to them. Right. It's interesting, too, that there is only one youth, one lad, that is leading him by the hand. Mm -hmm. you, would, uh, you would have considered that such a dangerous enemy of the Philistines would have at least been under guard. It doesn't seem to be. Um, but. So. Then his brethren and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshahal in the burying place of Manoah, his father. And he judged Israel 20 years. So you have those of his brethren, the Israelites, and the house of his father. So why would the Philistines allow such a dangerous enemy the honor of letting him being buried in his own country? Um, well, I don't know. I mean, a lot of them died. So um, but yeah, so they're going to go and get the body of Samson. So I'm not really sure. I'm I mean, not sure what this symbolizes either. But. Well, the situation that, that comes to my mind after the death of Saul and his sons, didn't 
they didn't those of Israel have to basically go by night to to recover the body of Saul and his sons? I don't remember. Okay. The immense building was thronged with the brave and the fair. Even the roof was crowded with thousands of spectators. After a time, as if weary, Samson asked permission to rest against the two central pillars which supported the temple roof. Then he breathed a prayer. O Lord Jehovah, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. With these words, he seized the pillars in his mighty arms, and with the cry, let me die with the Philistines, he bowed himself. Stand. Okay, go on. He bowed himself, and the roof fell, destroying at one dead crash all that vast company. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. God designed that Samson should accomplish a great work for Israel. Hence, the utmost care had been taken at the very outset of life to surround him with the most favorable conditions for physical strength, intellectual vigor, and moral purity. Had he not in after years ventured among the ungodly and the licentious, he would not so basely have yielded to temptation. Physically, he was the strongest man upon the earth, but in self-control, in integrity, and in firmness, he was the weakest of men. So he was very much a dichotomy. His passions were not held in subjection to reason and the fear of God. The blandishments of beautiful women often have dangerous temptations to the young. Those who do not make God their strength will be overcome by Satan's devices. The very men whom God purposes to use as his servants, the dread adversary uses his utmost power to lead astray. Yet the sacred word presents for our encouragement noble examples of men who have in the strength of God resisted the fiercest attacks of the powers of darkness. The youthful Joseph was subjected to a most severe temptation. It came from one in high position, one whose enmity might destroy his worldly prospects. The future of Joseph's life was determined by the decisions made in that trying hour. He calmly looked up to heaven and exclaimed, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The fires of unholy passion were not permitted to kindle. God's commands, God's promise were before Joseph. He felt that the all-seeing eye was upon him, extending to all of his thoughts, penetrating to the secrets of the heart, to the motives underlying every action. Samson, in his peril, had the same source of strength as had Joseph. He could choose the right or the wrong as he pleased. But instead of taking hold of the strength of God, he permitted the wild passions of his nature to have full sway. The reasoning powers were perverted. The morals corrupted. God had called Samson to a position of great responsibility, of great honor, and of great usefulness. But he must first learn to govern by first learning to obey the laws of God. Joseph was a free moral agent. Good and evil were before him. He could choose the path of purity, holiness, and honor, or the path of immorality and degradation. He chose the right way, and God approved Samson 
excuse me, he chose the right way and God approved, period. Samson, under certain similar temptations, which he had brought upon himself, gave loose rein to passion. The path which he entered upon, he found to end in shame, disaster, and death. What a contrast to the history of Joseph. The youths of today can bless or blight their future life. God calls young men in the strength and glory of their manhood to do service for him. But many whom God could use refuse to obey. They desire to secure worldly gain and worldly honor. To become a servant of Christ, they consider as requiring too great a sacrifice. The history of Samson conveys a lesson for those whose characters are yet unformed who have not yet entered into the stage of active life. The youth who enter our schools and colleges will find their every class of mind. If they desire sport and folly, if they seek to shun the good and unite with the evil, they have the opportunity. Sin and righteousness are before them and they are to choose for themselves. But let them remember that whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit and of that spirit reap life everlasting. Samson was presented with a major choice and he chose poorly. He repented of that when he was blinded and left as a grist mill operator. How does that apply to what we're seeing within the movement today? What else do we see here? So if you're taking the moral story, how are you going to apply this to the movement? Well, I mean, as we look at this, not just in the moral story, I mean, here again, we turn this upside down. Samson represents Christ. Christ represented a, an example for how we are to live our lives. Mm -hmm. In the moral story, Samson represents that, that we are to shun. Right. I mean, so one of the things that, that I saw when I was in Arkansas in 2018, which Heidi and I saw that was a warning sign, was the party spirit, the, the desire for fun. Um, which I've never seen as a goal. Uh, fun is not a goal. It might be a byproduct of doing th things sometimes, but never would you seek fun. Um, but there was all this fun that people wanted to have. And, and that's one thing that Parminder's movement really liked to do, was have fun. Um, so, so this idea of sport and folly um this is what our brains have been programmed to desire you know, solomon says it's better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting Um, just another side, I know this is a little bit going back a bit, but uh, dealing with 1629, the Hebrew word um, uh, that is uh, Strong's number, 1629, is um, this word that means uh, garatz. It's, it's where you get the word gerizim. Uh, that's just the plural of gerats, 
But geratz means to cut off, to separate, uh, to eat or to devour. Um, also to a locust. Wasn't there a separation when we came to 45 in the, in the charts? Because we came to 1843. Yeah. And wasn't there a type of separation that occurred there? Yeah. Yeah, the separation between uh, the first and second angel's messages and the classes. So the Gerizim would apply to this. Yeah, so you have Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal, and it's going to be Gerizim, that's the Mount of Blessing, right? And Ebal, that's the Mount of Cursing? I believe correct. And we also have, in a sense, a right hand and a left hand, a north and a south. Right. But also we have the symbol of the locust, which would be Islam. There's just more symbols that tie to um, our movement. Okay. Now, you talk about 45 and 46. Well, you added 16 to 29 to get 45. Well, Judges 1630 would be 46 then. Correct. So when we look at this in the ironic story on 1630, Samson is basically looking to die to provide salvation, even for the Philistines. Yeah, and, and the word, um, if we took the Hebrew number again, so we're just taking these these verses and using the Hebrew number. 1630 is Gerizim. So 29, 16, 29, and 1630 are basically tied together. Yeah, one is just, uh, yeah. Now the thing then about this uh, regarding uh, the left and the right hand being the north and the south, Ebal and Gerizim, those in a sense are mirrors as well. Right, so we could look at Samson is representing uh, the symbol of the curse, and Christ the symbol of the blessing, because it's this is a mirror, right? Samson's a mirror to Christ, right? Just as uh, Ebal and Gerizim are a mirror. What other applications can be made? I mean, the left and the right, we have the Sadducees and we have the Pharisees. We've also commented that left and right can represent the conservatives and the liberals. Well, uh, Democrats and Republicans, yeah. We have not, you know, in, in this situation, we are given the admonition not to turn to the right hand nor to the left. So, because the, you know, as, as I've looked at that, the combination when that's being presented, not to turn to the right hand or the left, that's, that's basically saying that it doesn't matter whether it's left or right, 
that is one full class that we're not to be participating in. Yeah, we have the straight and narrow way. Right. Is there anything else that we're seeing here? Any other application that we can make? Right now, the plan that we, we have addressed is to go back over much of what we have been studying throughout the book of Judges and begin placing this upon lines. So will these lines be parallel lines? Will they be like a lattice where they're going to cross each other? What? How do we see this so far? Well, well, they parallel lines. I mean, but they do. Um, you know, when we look at a line, we zoom in to a way mark. We're going to see another line. So we can take any line that we correct can uh, create and put it over top of another line. I mean, in, in that way, they're sort of, they have these places and where they cross, which is kind of like a lattice. But the point is to understand how these lines represent something. Right. Um, so, you know, when we go from 2001 uh, to 2023, because that's what Judges Chapter 2 gives us, um, it's giving us the history of this movement from 2001 to 2023. And, and so that's what we've been examining as we've gone through first, the enemies that were still left in the land, and then the internal enemies, right? Um, and, you know, I don't know if all of us remember every one of the, the different enemies, but you, you're going to have after the death of Joshua, you're going to have um, these different judges that are going to be raised up in response to, uh, you know, Othniel, Ehud, and um, Shamgar, right? And then you got Deborah and Barak who are going to be uh, fighting against, uh, um, what's his name? Jabin of Canaan and Sisera, right? So, so we went through these, and we need to go through them again. And then you're going to have Midian oppress Israel, and you're going to have Gideon. But then you have start to have this internal, which is Abimelech. And, and then you're going to have Jephthah, the Samson. And, and so, you know, so as we go through each of these and put them on a line, I mean, they're talking about our movement progressively. That's the way that I understand it. But they do represent different lines. In, in, in each in, in and of, it, of themselves, they represent a line of what's happened in this movement. All right. So this is going to be the goal for the balance of the week. We're going to be putting this onto a board, laying out the lines and having to look at this and then apply these with what we're seeing currently. Now, are different portions of what we're seeing in judges that we've already studied, will we return to these and look at them in the ironic sense, just as we've done here, in this story with Samson? I don't think so. I'm not sure what basis we'd have for doing that. Not well, just a question. Yeah. No, I, I think what we would do is we would review judges 
um, not going into all the verses and all the details, just try to recall what we understood about uh, these symbols and how they related to uh, messages that were um, addressed in this movement, false messages and true messages to counter those false messages. Um, when we get to Samson, we have a lot of detail and a lot of things that tie Samson to various other histories, specifically to Christ, but also in the story of Delilah itself, the four angels' messages, the three plus one. Um, but then we, we specifically, in through all of this, we start to see the symbols of this movement as they progress. And, and so it is rather interesting that when we get here to Judges 16, uh, we get to a date just in our immediate future that has symbolic um, importance. And because it's Thanksgiving, right? That's what we're, we're pointing to with this 1629. And we had this Thanksgiving prediction back in 2018, which was suppressed. And, and the purpose of that Thanksgiving prediction was to see whether we could predict external events, right? We weren't trying to predict anything. We were trying to see if we can take the symbols. And, and Jeff acknowledged that it was correct. Uh, Stephen was there, so he can testify of that. Even though the meeting was recorded, it was never released. So we now have no recordings of those meetings that happened on November 10th. 2019 but that was it was three different meetings we had um, uh, the first two in which I presented and the third in which Jeff presented primarily so he went through what I had presented and then uh, we discussed it is that correct Stephen is that how you remember it yeah you you seem to remember more than I do but uh so sounds familiar. Yeah, okay. Yeah, well, I've gone over it in my head a number of times. Um, so, so anyway, that the purpose of that prediction, so this is in 2019. We look at it a year later, um, and, and Jeff, Jeff says, you know, this is what we already understand. Now, he interpreted uh, what, what had happened differently than I would have had interpreted but but that was part of the point is that even after the event had passed we couldn't really agree upon an interpretation we could agree that the prophecy or the date that was produced uh was correct but we didn't have any specific event that we could mark we just had symbolic uh issues that arose and, and this is part of the problem that this movement has been dealing with, because I've, I've taken the position that we can't predict external events. So when I look at November uh, 24, 2022, I look at it as a symbolic date. It ties us to the past, to the November 22, 2018 prediction. Um, and it ties us to um, also, um, our whole line, right? So it gives us these symbols of the 1111. Um, so if we're going to, you know, if we're going to understand what's being symbolized here, if we're gonna understand what God is trying to show us, I mean, one thing he's showing us is that we can't predict the future. And that even when we are in the midst of prophecy being fulfilled, it's the experience that we are having that is the most important. That is, this is about us, our experience with God, the receiving of light, and, and our walking in the light of the midnight cry. And I think this is hard for Adventists to understand, that we, we sort of look at prophecy as something that, in a sense, we're, we're not a part of. It's just something that happens. So 
But prophecy is really what happens to God's people. God's people are experiencing prophecy. But we, we tend not to personalize it in that way. So it'll be interesting to see what happens as we put these lines, as we lay them out, because uh, I think we'll be able to see things a lot more clearly, of course. Okay. We have about eight minutes remaining in our meeting today. Are there any other questions or thoughts for what we're what we have covered in the last couple of sessions? Not for me at this time. Okay. There's a lot really to have to consider here with Samson, especially when we flip the story on its head. And there's going to be some other points that as we go through this with judges that we're going to need to be prepared on because there's, there's actually quite a relevance in taking Judges 2 and outlining it to the events within the movement and then looking at the book of Judges in total mm -hmm. as a representation of the church and the movement. Yeah, and now when we know the last five chapters of Judges actually occurs prior to um, events that are in uh, the beginning of Judges, right? So, uh, and we studied that before, and then we, that's why we're at the end of Judges 16. We're not like going through these chapters again, but we also really haven't understood how, why those chapters are at the end rather than at the beginning and how they relate then to our lines. Well, here again, from the conversation we were having at the outset of today's meeting, before we got into the meeting, mm -hmm. if we go back and we were to review Daniel's last vision, presentation number 23, Elder Jeff was very clear because he was going back over how the last seven presidents of the general conference are represented by the last seven kings of Judah. Mm -hmm. These last chapters in the book of Judges <clears throat> occur at the outset of the time of the judges. Mm -hmm. But <clears throat> the the situation is that it is a, a revelation of the mess that has occurred within the church itself. One of the questions that I had asked is, is when was it possible for those final chapters of the book of Judges to have occurred? given that we have Phinehas standing before the Ark of the Covenant, it is very possible that those chapters occurred about 70 years after crossing the Jordan. It could have been less, but it's not going to be that much more. And the other thing we have in that story, um, because in in the story of Samson, 
in chapter 16. And then in chapter 17, we're going to have the 1,100 pieces of silver. Right. Um, these two different uh, symbols. Um, and, of course, 1,100 and 1,100, those, those are, um, you know, the symbol of the 1111 as well. But we don't know why that is, why we have this in this story in Judges 17, which is much earlier. You have 1,100 pieces of silver, and then you have the 1,100 pieces of silver in the story of Samson. But you're going to have them as back-to-back chapters. So there, there must be something there as well. So there's a bunch of things that we don't fully understand about Judges, why it's structured the way it is. Um, we also have to address the chronology of Judges more specifically. Um, so there is a number of problems with the book of Judges that we still haven't solved. Right. So these are all going to be points that we're going to have to be bringing up as we are addressing these situations, because you're right, there's something very definitely necessary for us to look at regarding these 1100 pieces of silver in Judges 17 and the 1100 pieces of silver multiplied by five that we find within the story here of, of Samson and Delilah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we take the 1100 multiplied by five to get a symbol. I think the five is the symbol and the 1100 is the symbol. I would have to consider that. Yeah. Because I, I could find nothing for multiplying it by five. But we have lots of symbols for the five itself, um, symbolizing the five wise, the five foolish. And, of course, the 1100 um, itself in the two stories that ties them together. Okay. So if there is nothing, no other comment or no other question at this time, shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we have great need of your wisdom and of your spirit to instruct us and direct us as we examine the events in these chapters and look then to proceed and continue in this study in the book of Judges. Be with us each one today. Guide us where you would have us to walk. Direct our paths, direct our thoughts, direct our actions so that others may see your character and not ours. For it is to your glory that we are to give a message to this world. Help us to this end. For this we thank you and this we praise you. In the name of Jesus, amen.